here at the profile we like to i guess start at the beginning mm. so um give us a sense of what life was like for you growing up um as a vicar's son yeah vicar's son uh, uh, certainly the first 10 years were pretty idyllic. We lived in uh, Norfolk, uh, the first three years in Cromer on the coast, where my parents now retire to. And then my dad was vicar of a church uh, in Grimston, which is a rural parish just outside Kings Lynn. And um, we lived in this big vicarage amongst the fields. Uh, I just had a great time there, kind of those days of riding the bike around the village after school. The days seemed to go on forever, hot summers. I, I think we just forget the bad ones <laughs> when you look back. But... I had a, you know, amazing time there and I loved it. And, you know, a lot of my best friends were uh, churchgoers as well. So, you know, Sunday school wasn't a chore. It was just like another chance to see your mates and hang out with them and stuff. And then we moved down to Surrey when I was 10. And that was quite a big culture shift, not just in terms of where you're living. We were kind of in Cheam in Surrey. So it's a, it's a kind of commuter belt, Reggie Perry land, as I call it. And, and suddenly I'm launched into the private school system to go to a prep school because it was founded for vicar's sons so there's no way a vicar can afford private school so i went on the free and you know the cultural change in that and it, you know it's an amazing church though in Cheen that, that dad led for 13 years and again a lot of my closest friends in that period of life and i'm still mates with some of them are were, were guys and girls from my church so you know church was a really important part of life and i always say this i'm really grateful to to mum and to dad, although that was his job and it did make him proud when his kids turned up to church rather than got to an age and said, I'm not coming again. You know, I knew that was important to him, but it was never, ever, ever forced on us that this is what you should believe. It was kind of, this is what we do believe as a family. And, you know, in time, I was able to kind of work it out for myself. But, um, I, you know, I can't, I look back on my childhood and think, you know, I was, I was really blessed to have two loving parents who stayed together to live in different places, experience different cultures and stuff. And, um, yeah, I think looking back and I was pretty blessed. Mm. Well, do you remember a moment where it didn't become your parents' faith and it became your own? I remember a moment where it, it became very real to me and I was age seven at the time. And we uh, we were at home as a Saturday morning and dad had meetings. Oh, why do vicars have so many meetings? But anyway, he had meetings <laughs> and it just rained all morning. We were going sort of stir crazy and then we had lunch and dad was free in the afternoon and the, the sort of sun came out. So he said, well, let's, let's get in the car and go to these woods nearby called Massingham Woods and let's go for a walk. And so off we went as a family and we were walking through this big pine forest and in amongst all the pine trees that are totally unclimbable. And I was at that age, I just want to climb every tree that's available, but you can't get up a pine tree. And there was this kind of big yew tree and it was climbable, so I climbed up into it. And then eventually I sort of sat down in the yew bit with my legs dangling there. My mum was stood there holding my little sister Hannah because she was still very young. And then Becky, my next sister, who was six at the time, my dad was stood there and it starts raining again. And mum sort of looked at me and said, I think we should move to the other side of the clearing to get in the shelter and we're kind of that's ridiculous because we are already sheltered and about a minute later she said it again you know I think we really should move and again we kind of dad said oh don't be silly to you we're, we're, we're fine here and then I, I can still all these years later I can still hear the tone in her voice and I can see the look in her eyes she looked at me and then dad again said we, we need to move now and so I think to keep the peace dad said you know come on let's get out the tree and let's let's move across keep your mum happy type thing and as we get across so probably 30 seconds later in terms of what it sounded like it sounded like a tornado jet was coming fast through the forest above our heads and I remember looking up and there's just this channel of fire above our heads and this ginormous explosion and then a huge thud and as the smoke cleared the tree where I'd been sat in just a minute or so before had been basically blown apart by what's called ball lightning that happens quite a bit particularly in Norfolk and we ran crying screaming back to the car and some friends of ours from our church some very close friends came around and sat with us that afternoon because you know we're traumatized why wouldn't you be and we did go back later that night and I've still got the picture on my desk uh, of us stood by the tree looking at what had happened and our friend Rosemary asked mum why did you feel you should move at that point because there's no sense to you mm. needing to move and she just said i i just heard a voice that said you need to move and you need to move now and i just believe it was god and you know at that moment some people might think that's just a, an amazing coincidence but at that point it became real 
I felt there was this God out there who was looking after us that day for whatever reason. He 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 protected us from what was going to happen. You know, and years later, I I, I remember speaking at a church and the, and the guy who led the church came up to me afterwards and I didn't talk about this story at all. He just said, I was on Blue Peter at the time. He said, Look, I just want to pray for you. And as he's praying, he just said, I, I get a sense that something happened to you when you were young, when you were six or seven, that gave you a really stark reminder in a very real way that God is real. And I said, yeah, I nearly got killed by lightning. And I still have that picture on my desk. And when I've had those moments with everything that's happened in the last 19 months, sometimes I look at that tree and remember that God was there that day and he's actually been there ever since. Mm. Perhaps we'll come back to that story a little, <laughs> little bit later. Just a little story yeah, just to get no, us going. I think that's it's fa fascinating. Um, so your dad's a, a vicar. Faith's important to you. Did you ever fancy following in his footsteps at all, going into sort of ministry? No, but I have had people <laughs> people say that to me. I remember when we left uh, dad's church in Cheam and we had the big final service. <laughs> it was like one of those wedding lineups. I guess it was just... A, you know, try and say goodbye to as many people as possible in one go. But we sort of lined up as a family by the doors. And there was a quite a prophetic guy called Brian Kennett at the church. And uh, I think he's still around. I've not seen him for a long time. But he sort of shook my hand and sort of clasped my hand, you know, with both his hands. And he just said, you know, going forward, just remember the ministry. And I was like, Brian, I don't want to hear this. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've, I've sometimes thought about it, but but at the moment, you know, I do think it's not something you just decide to do, like becoming a banker or something. I think you, there has to be a calling, and I don't at the moment. I don't sense a calling. <laughs> <laughs> so you did decide a career in media, TV. Um, yeah, yeah. Where did that desire come from? Well, I used to get asked about that in terms of Blue Peas. Like, was it a, a lifelong ambition? I, being honest, I used to watch the show as a kid and think that would be an amazing job. I didn't ever sit there from being honest and think I would ever do that job. But it was really at university. I went to Birmingham University in the early 90s and we had a an internal TV station called Guild TV. I mean, the output, utterly awful looking back. But they had a, a proper studio because Pebble Mill, which was the old BBC studios in Birmingham, long gone, but they got a lot of secondhand equipment from there. So they built a proper studio with a proper gallery and three cameras, earpiece, mixing. and everything. It was all there, pretty low rent, but it was there. And I started doing a program on, on a Friday lunchtime, watched by nobody, <laughs> went out in the guild, the days before flat screens, it was just little portables everywhere, it was on mute, called The Lunchbox. And I just, I just got a bug for it, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the thrill of doing live TV, even though no one was watching. <laughs> And I remember as I left university, uh, um, one of the, the girls who'd worked on the station for quite a while, she just said, what do you think you're doing next? I said, I don't know. I'm sort of thinking, I'm thinking I'd quite like to do this. She said, look, you're really good at this. I think you should go for it. And I said, yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm going to. I'm going to go for Blue Peter because that's, for me, the best show out there. And, you know, it was a three and a half year journey in the end. I, I remember going back to my parents' house in Beckles. Dad had moved from Cheen to Beckles. That was where he had his last parish. And it was a blisteringly hot day in July, I think it was, in the summer of 1995. And I'm, I've got a book on how to become a TV presenter, written by Toby Anstis, who'd done CBBC, he's now on Heart, I think. And I knew I had to make a showreel tape, and I wanted to write lots of letters to different TV production companies and TV stations to see if I get some work experience, just to get my foot in the door, start meeting the right people. And I had my list, my kind of hit list of people I was going to write to. And I just thought, crikey, I haven't really prayed about this. You know, this is a perhaps just a fanciful dream. And I'm about to, I don't know why, I'd just give myself three years to make it. I'm about to waste three years because God might not actually be in this. So I thought, right, I'm going to pray about this. And so I remember sat in the room I used in, in Suffolk in Beckles and just prayed and I just said, God, I just, I just need a sign. As I begin to, to write in these letters and I begin to think about a show real tape, I just need to know you're in this, that this is, this is the direction you want to take me. And about an hour later, Dad had gone out and got on his old, crusty Apple Mac as it was at the time and it was about to start writing the first letter and I looked to my left and dad has got this little pile of Christian magazines and I can't to this day remember what it was called the magazine but I remember seeing on the front the kind of side sub headlines of the articles inside it was one saying why we need more Christians in the media and it'd be written by Steve Chalk who I then end up working for a few years later and Pam Rhodes who was doing Songs of Praise at the time and it was one of those moments I don't know the people listening or watching this have, have sat in church or at a a big, a big Christian event or whatever it might be. And as that person up the front speaks, you feel like you're the only person in the room. Like that talk is just for you. And it felt like this article had been written just for me. And it was all about how as Christians, it's no good as just complaining from the sidelines about we're not enjoying what we're seeing on the TV or we don't like what's been written in the newspapers or we don't like what we hear on the radio. If you want to change things, 
you need to do what Jesus did and you get involved. He didn't park his tent on the side of Jerusalem, so you come to me. He went to people. And obviously people did come to him, but he, he got his hands dirty. I just thought, this is it, the green light. I mean, God's timing is often different, isn't it? But it was three and a half years uh, after that point that I finally get the Blue Peter gig. But that's that was the moment I thought, God is in this, and I've just got to remain faithful. So when I was working in Selfridges, not too far from here, for two and a half years selling suits, and I'm thinking, this wasn't quite what I dreamt of and doing a running job at CBBC at the weekends and LBC radio in the week. Um, I just had to hold on to that day and that promise. And eventually, eventually in end of 1998, it becomes fulfilled. And then having faith within that industry, was that something that you found particularly difficult in BBC at Sky as well? I think Blue Peter was easier in, in so far as it was a show that was comfortable reflecting faith. And, you know, at Christmas, they never shied away from the Christmas story. It's one of the Blue Peter traditions, isn't it? Putting the, you know, the figures into the, into the stable scene on the Christmas show that they do every year and having the carol singers coming up the hill like they did every year. You know, they, Christmas was about the Christmas story and they never shied away from that. I had the opportunity to go to the Solomon Islands and film for two weeks with these amazing Christian brothers called the Melanesian Brotherhood. These amazing group of guys who go around the islands and, you know, do lots of amazing things in terms of ministry. And I was able to speak quite openly in that film about my faith as I kind of wrapped up the film at the end and reflected on the two weeks with these guys. I was able to talk about my faith. It's more difficult when you're presenting Manchester United against Tottenham, talk about your faith, because you can't really come on air and say, uh, you know, welcome to Old Trafford, big game this Saturday lunchtime. But before we get going, Graham Souness and Jamie Redknapp, let me just tell you, God loves you. He loves you and he's died for you. Right, Graeme, tell us about the free changes Tottenham made today. Yeah, it, it, there's no scope for that. You know, one thing I did do a few years back, because I, I did want people to know when, when social media was kind of exploding and we were on Twitter and, and all those kind of things, I, I remember looking at my profile one day and, and I can't remember what I'd written, but uh, in amongst it was the fact I was, a, I was married, I was a dad, I was a Norwich City fan, an ex-Blue Peter presenter, now Sky Sport presenter. Nowhere do I say that I'm a Christian. And I thought, I'm gonna just put that on there. And I made it the first thing about my profile. Not a massive thing, but I wanted people to know. And it was hard in terms of, it was quite a nomadic existence going around doing the football because you don't have loads of time in the office. You're essentially traveling to a ground, you get there, you have a bit of food on the bus and then you rehearse, then you do the football game and then everyone goes, gets in their cars to get home as quick as they can. So you don't have those long periods with your colleagues where you're able to kind of talk about your faith. And you know, I remember, you know, a lot of people from Sky coming to Gemma's funeral. Uh, and I never shied away from talking about my faith and my struggles with my faith because of what had happened. And quite a few came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I feel bad that you didn't feel you could talk like that when you were working with us. And part of me felt sad that maybe I hadn't, but you know, it's, it, was, it was always there, but it was a harder environment in which to be kind of open about your faith. Mm. So let's talk about Gemma, you met her kind of as your careers, I guess, in some ways, getting off the ground. W what was meeting her like, love at first sight? It was unexpected at first sight in that I had gone. I mean, bizarrely, she ended up working for, so I worked for the Oasis Trust. That's how my path with Steve Chalk crossed all those years ago. And I ended up working in their media department when kind of the TV dream looked like it was probably over. And I was having to think, what do I do now? And anyway, a kind of long story short, Richard Bacon does something naughty, the door opens and, and somehow I land the job. So I end up doing that. And, and a year or two later, Gemma ends up doing the very job that I was doing at Oasis. And I had apparently had a conversation on the phone about a project they wanted me to be involved with. And then our, our old boss, well, my old boss, Ivor Peters, was having a, a sort of champagne soiree at the end of September, sort of late summer party. And... Uh, Gemma was going to as well, but I didn't know Gemma at this point, didn't know she was going, and I'd actually gone there with my eye on someone else from Oasis. I'm not going to say their name, but I, I did, and I was like, I got there, I tried, tried my best to chat her up, didn't go very well, retreated back to the, the bosom of, of the lads. And, uh, and then I saw Gemma, I'd never seen this girl before, she looked, you know, just what she was wearing was beautiful, and, and I got introduced to her, and it was just... You know, those moments in life when you meet someone and you kind of you feel like you've been chatting for five minutes and realize it's been half an hour you know and just i just felt an immediate connection with them what i liked about her is that i sometimes felt because of what i did that people would talk to you as simon the blue peter presenter and not the person and it wasn't that she wasn't interested in that but i felt that she was actually talking to me and interested in me not 
where's the best place you've traveled to? What's the most amazing thing you've done? And I broke the lad's rules that night on the way home. I, I got her number and I texted her. We used to have this 48 hour rule in the house. <laughs> but I lived in, but I broke it. I didn't care. Um, and I met her a couple of weeks later and and we we began dating from there. So it was, yeah, it was totally unexpected but that's that's one of the joys of life isn't it mm. it doesn't always go quite how you planned yeah and then you get married a few years later yeah but in your book you say the, the kind of that beginning of the marriage wasn't particularly easy right no we we we, uh, we had to put up with for want of a better phrase endure some some quite tough stuff you know Gemma had a, a, a physical problem um, that meant uh, you know in terms of consummating our marriage we couldn't for the first few months and it was desperately hard for her in particular because she felt less of a woman because of it and you know without going into too much detail she, she had to have an operation quite early on and for the first eight months of our marriage we're actually not too far from where we sit here we're going to counseling once a week sometimes the two of us sometimes as, in, as individuals not the kind of thing you dream about doing in the first few months of your marriage you, you don't but you know it's one of those things that it's either gonna sadly push you away from each other or you just say we're going to get through this and that was kind of actually is look it's 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 not perfect but then what in life is and we just need to get through this we will get through this and i think going through that and other experiences that came along did make us stronger because we were having to deal with what i describe as storms pretty early on and you shared a faith was that mm. important at that time yeah definitely because i think when you are really struggling and you're struggling to work life out at least when you've got faith you've kind of got you've kind of got that reassurance that somewhere in all this, God is somewhere in this and that he will, you know, kind of bring us through this and, you know, just being able to get prayer for stuff from, from you know, members of our home group who, or, or whoever it may be was, was really important in terms of just when it was really tough, just holding on. So your boy Ethan comes along a little later. What, what did it mean for you personally to become a dad? Everything. I absolutely. I'm, that that day he was born in the September of two thousand nine in St George's Tooting in London. I can't. I mean, you're a parent yourself, and parents listening. You, I just you can't describe it. You cannot describe the time you first hold your child. I mean, it would be a bit spectacular because Gemma's labour was quite long, and to try and push things along, the midwife asked her to hover over a loo, and he literally burst into this world down a toilet. <laughs> the, the midwife performed a wonderful slip catch, and, and then I, you handed this, there he is. And I just, I can't describe it, just this incredible just love you feel instantly. You know, because I think before you become parents, you're a bit worried about, you know, am I going to have enough love? Am I going to be able to do this? But as soon as you hold your own flesh and blood in your hands, you're just like, it's instant. It's yeah. just, I just adore this this boy. I remember looking into my boy's eyes and no one can prepare you for that moment. No, so got, and they he, gaze back. He is mine. Yeah. Uh, he's fr from me. It's something quite powerful, isn't it? It's, it's utterly amazing when you think about it. We will talk about Ethan, I'm, I'm sure, mm. when we, we come more on to the book, but what does he mean to you now in terms of um he's now nine yeah nine, nine. Yeah. um the impact that he's had on your life over yeah. kind of the past decades what, what what's that meant to you everything i uh, the relationship i have with him now it was always re really really good but it's now remarkable i describe him as my son but also my best friend we're like mates as well as father and son you know and i just i love spending time with him um i I remember seeing a post last summer, and I guess because of what we've been through, I see it in a slightly different way, but uh, bless her, a mum at our school, <laughs> literally the day they broke up, she'd obviously gone on timeanddate.com and worked out to the nearest minute how long it was before they went back to school. And I understand from a parent's point of view, that's six weeks, as I found out last year, without Gemma around, it's a big amount of time to fill. And I've only got one kid. Um, but when I read that, I thought, that's, that's sad. And I, I thought, I'm going to try and say this in as sensitive a way as possible but just making the point and i just wrote on her facebook page on that on that post and just said you know one day one day you will crave one more summer holiday with the kids you will crave it so enjoy it and she just wrote back and said i'm you're so right you're so right and you know i think now i just i absolutely rinse out i think we did it anyway because we weren't able to have any more children we knew that we were only ever going to do stuff once with him i know we'd only do stuff once with any kid we have but in terms of the nativity play at school when in year two i think it is they, they get the speaking part 
and it's the only year where you get a speaking part. The rest of school's involved, but that's your year for getting a speaking part. So when Ethan had his speaking part in year two, we went to every single showing of the Nativity Play. I think it was three or four times we went to it. The reason was, and some people are like, oh, you're here again? <laughs> Because we wanted to rinse it out because we knew that we're never going to sit down and watch one of our other children in year two saying those lines. And it did make us, much as we wanted to have other children, it made us as a couple, it makes me now as a dad as well, on my own, absolutely rinse out every moment I've got with him. Because the years are fleeting. You know, he's nine now, in the blink of an eye, he'll be 18 and grumpy and wanting to move out, maybe. you got to, you, I just, I rinse out. And I think because of that, it makes the relationship so much closer because like so much in life now I just I do not take it for granted hmm. in the book you talk um about the the periods um after you're you're, you're married and and you, you work in um you come across this issue of um depression hmm. um give us a sense of what it first felt like to realize that you had a battle on your hands well I had two bouts of it and the first came um, a few years back and it was after we had the second round of IVF so we we found out after having Ethan and we began to you know try to have a another kid that Gemma had a very serious fertility problem that meant her chances of conceiving naturally were very very remote so we looked into IVF and we decided we'd give it two goes and the first time it didn't work the second time it did work and Gemma fell pregnant but very sadly only a month later she miscarries and at that point we knew our dreams of Ethan ever having a brother or sister are gone uh, hugely hugely difficult for Gemma because again she felt it's another physical problem that's mine it's my fault and I didn't deal with it very well not in terms of her but kind of my own anger and bitterness that because we live in an age where not just physically but in terms of online we're very aware of whether when other people are having kids the scan photo goes up or huge celebrations kid number four has arrived and our perception is is that our friends are popping out kids like a, a cash dispenser pops out 10 pound notes the truth is it's not always like that but you, I had that hugely angry bitter period where I just couldn't stand to hear news of anyone else falling pregnant uh, and I think it drove me to quite a bad place the counsellor we had after that failure that that miscarriage said Simon's in his cave and she said to Gemma you kind of need to leave him there until he's ready to come out my problem was I stayed in there too long and as I did I went into a much darker place but with that bout of depression the first time I'd felt it it's deeply disconcerting um, you feel very very isolated very alone that no one else is feeling like I'm feeling that kind of struggle to get out of bed in the morning but somehow I managed to keep working throughout that period because I just found that in a bizarre way going on air which for people watching and listening will sound weird if they have no experience of ever being sat in front of a camera. How can that be your kind of release from it? But it was because when the red light went on and the count in your ear went down to one, we're on air. It's like a switch went bang. And it was my kind of holiday, my time away from everything I was feeling. And I got through that through medication and counselling. And then in the, the summer of 2017, I can honestly say life felt as good and as peaceful as it ever had done you know that all that kind of angst about really wish we could have another kid had gone and we were at peace with who we were and we were enjoying life I'm in the second season of doing the Premier League on Sky that was the the dream job when I arrived at Sky in 2005 was to get to do the Premier League and I finally got there second season here we go and suddenly out of nowhere in sort of late September this this I, I felt my mood changing uh, and interesting talking to Gemma's mum Wendy in the last few weeks she talks about how Gemma had picked up on something quite a lot earlier than I had and said she was actually worried about me. And this was back in August. And I felt my mood darken a little bit, but I couldn't really put my finger on why. But then this anxiety came into play that I'd never experienced before. Suddenly, my job became my worst enemy. And it then, over time, over those next few weeks, develops into panic attacks before going on air. I still managed to get on air. And actually, my, my boss in... The weeks after Gemma went, when we talked more about what I was going through in that period, he said, do you know, the bizarre thing is when I've watched those games back where I know now what was happening to you before you went on air, your performance levels, if anything, went up a gear, up a level. I just said, well, that's just the remarkable thing about the brain. But it was, it was such a disconcerting period because everything you felt sure about in terms of my ability to do the job, I suddenly feel like I can't do it. And my job's now becoming my enemy. And it's, it's a horrible place to be and everything you felt was sure in terms of the foundations of life just feel like they are completely wobbling and you don't recognise yourself anymore. And the scary thing is you think, I don't know 
how I get out of this. So I guess people are a little bit more educated now when it comes to mental health, mm. but there will still be some in the church who will say, can't get depressed, you're a Christian, you've got the joy of the Lord, that's your strength. What would you say to those people? I'd say they're talking rubbish. Sorry, I'm just going to say it. They are, because that's like saying you're a Christian, so you know people don't die young. Well, they do. They do. And it's like saying, well, you're a Christian, you know, you shouldn't have cancer. People get it because we live in a broken world and God does not promise us freedom from that. He doesn't. He promises us a whole host of things. He promises in the face of death, eternal life. He gives us hope and, and so many things, but he does not promise us an easy road if we decide to follow him. And that may be for some Christians listening that that road has been really difficult because you know, they have suffered with depression or anxiety or panic attacks or whatever it might be. God doesn't promise you that that's not going to happen. But what you know is that his promise that I will be with you to the end of time is true. And even in your darkest moments, the God I believe in still sits alongside you and never leaves your side. And that's, that's a, that's, that gives you, even in your darkest moments, hope, which is everything. You know, if you're going through grief or whatever it might be, to have hope is massive. But yeah, you, you, there are lots of Christian leaders out there who may not admit it, but I know they, they've suffered with their own mental health issues. And it's actually far better for us to be real about this kind of stuff than pretending it doesn't happen and, and trying to argue in some bizarre way that it's, it's you're a Christian, so you should be all right. Because, yeah, God did not ordain us to feel like this and to experience these problems, but this is the problem when sin entered the world so did all these kind of things as well. With that in mind then, for somebody who's listening now, they'll be at church on Sunday, mm. you know, despairing. I, I, I don't want to um, tell people that I'm going through mm. this difficult time. What would be your advice to them? My advice would be find someone you trust, you know, someone you, you know that you can tell some tough stuff to, and please do tell them. The worst thing you can do, I, I did it for quite a while the first time I got depression, I really kind of suffered in silence. Gemma knew what was going on, but really my friends didn't. And that means that in your really toughest times, that, that feeling of loneliness and isolation becomes even more pronounced. And you know, when we draw into really isolated places in life, actually they can be quite dangerous places to go. And I just say, just find someone you can reach out to and just, just tell them what's going on. Because I found that the most therapeutic thing for me, as well as you know, counseling has been hugely beneficial. It doesn't work for everyone, but it really works for me. I still see a grief counselor every single week. I mean, 19 months on from losing Gemma, but I still find it enormously helpful, even on the weeks where I go in there thinking, actually, I don't, really don't know what to talk about this week, but we always find something. Um, but it is so important to know you're not alone, and it's really important to be able to talk about it. I think we're too scared, both Christians and non-Christians, with the whole word vulnerable. And we don't want to appear vulnerable. We want the world to see the other side of us. But actually, I believe there is huge power in being vulnerable and open and honest about how you're feeling because you will draw strength from that that you never knew you had. So it seems like life's never really been kind of straightforward, plain no. sailing for you. Well, I'd, uh, say, I'd say it was for, you know, my childhood and my teenage years and, you know, and, and, and getting the job on Blue Peter. But no, the last few years, no, you're right. They've definitely not been straightforward. I want to go um, to the moment, though, that in the book you describe as the moment your world falls apart. Mm. Um, you realise something's not right with um, your wife, Gemma. She heads to the doctor. The doctor says, nothing to worry about. Mm. It's all okay. Yeah. What's going through your mind? Um, well, I believed him. You know, I think because I'm in the midst of this depression and anxiety and panic attacks, is I, I, I know... Looking back now, I wasn't seeing things with the clarity I probably would have done. Whether that would have changed the outcome, I very much doubt it. I, I look back on those moments and, and feel a huge, still now, sense of regret, but I've learned to let go of it, that I wasn't seeing things the way I see it now. But then, in the same way they say hindsight is a wonderful thing, it's also equally a horrible thing when you look back and go, oh, I should have done that. I should never have walked out the doctor's surgery on that second visit that came two days after the first visit on the Wednesday when unbeknown to us at that point, she's got less than a week to live and be happy that our doctor, well, it wasn't our doctor, it was a different one on this occasion, says, having looked at all your vital signs, I'm satisfied there's nothing seriously wrong with you. I look back and I go, how did you hear those words and look at your wife and know that she's barely moving from bed? She, there is definitely something seriously wrong here. Hopefully nothing too serious. I, I had a huge amount of anger in the early days and regret about not seeing things with the clarity that I think I could have done, but actually it's a futile 
thing to get caught up in. If you allow yourself to become bitter and resentful towards the doctors, you know, that with everything else you're dealing with, it's going to be so unhealthy. And I, I just had to learn, you know, to let it go and let go of the fact that she goes back in on the Monday and again is told the same thing by our doctor like he had on the Wednesday, just go back and rest up and if it carries on, come and see me again. She's at this point less than four days away from going. So you get some advice from some friends who are medics and you end up in, in A&E and you quickly get transferred to uh, another hospital. Mm. Um, you say in the book that you were utterly convinced she'd be okay. What mm. gave you that belief? I think it's that, I think there was a degree of, sh there's that shock. You know, the, the momentum of events w was so quick. You know, she gets diagnosed with a blood cancer of some sort in the early hours of that Tuesday morning in Reading. You know, I go back eventually to take Ethan to school to try and keep things as normal as possible. And then while we're traveling back to the Royal Barts in Reading, I get a text from her saying, you've got to get here now, I'm going to Oxford. And it just felt like this, this ball of momentum began to roll and suddenly I'm in the back of an ambulance. I actually took a video of some of the journey because I'm in shock. I'm not really computing what's going on. My wife is on a bed. She's got an oxygen mask to her face and I'm chatting to the paramedic about how quickly they're driving up a road. I've gone up and down loads and times for work. Um, and I think part of that belief she'd get better came out of shock and you know, I'm not really understanding what's going here. But actually, but at that point, we, we just knew it was a blood cancer, a leukemia of some sort. And actually, the reality is for far, far more people than ever before, leukemia is not a death sentence. Lots of people get better from it, thankfully. So you're thinking, we'll probably be okay. And I think there's an element in which, faith-wise, you're thinking, God will pull us through this. He, he will. So there, there were enough reasons for me to think, uh, however hard this is going to be, uh, yeah, I do. I think we'll be okay. I right. kept saying that to Gemma. I guess we go back to that story of your uh, coming to faith where you feel God has saved your yeah. life. God does save people. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen other stories. Mm. Is that playing in the back of your mind? You know, God heals, God God saves? Yeah, and actually, interestingly, one of the, one of the things I really remember Gemma saying, um, I think it was on the Wednesday, and we'd had some amazing couple of guys, one's called Carl Beach, who, uh, you know, has done, you know, been at Christian Vision for Men and all that, and Nathan Blackaby, who is at Christian Vision for Men. You know, two amazing guys. I'm really good friends with them. Just love them to bits. And they're amazing that they came, they drove for miles from their different place where they lived and came and prayed with Gemma that morning and prayed, you know, for her to be healed. There was a real sense of optimism in the room that God was going to deliver. And I remember her in the afternoon saying, once Carl and Nathan had gone home, she said, Darl, she often talks, said, your testimony, you've got so many stories. And I've got other moments where God really did show up in a very direct way. She said, I'm hoping this becomes my testimony. And I said, I'm sure it will, because this will be an amazing testimony, you coming through this, I mean, everything else you've been through. But it, it wasn't to be, but there was that sense that this, this would be an amazing story. How do you reflect back on your prayers from that time? Because some would look at it as you prayed and the prayer wasn't answered. Mm. How do you reflect on that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly that. My prayers were not answered. They weren't, not, were not in the way I was hoping anyway. You know, I prayed on that Friday morning as I'm told the news that, you know, there's nothing more they can do for her. She's got these multiple bleeds in, in her head because of the, the damage, the thickness of her blood with acute myeloid leukemia had caused, that there's no hope. And barring a miracle, she's going to be gone by the end of today. And, you know, I've never prayed with as much faith as I prayed for probably till about one o'clock that afternoon. Just my hand very rarely left her head barely noticed the doctors and nurses who were constantly coming in to check on her and just kept praying out loud, you know, God, God, heal this woman, you know, pray in the name of Jesus, you stop the bleeding now, and you, please, Lord, do not leave my boy without a mum. I, I wasn't thinking about myself at this point, but that thought of Ethan growing up without his mum and actually Gemma growing up, sorry, Gemma not getting to see her boy grow up, just kept pleading with God, please, 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 please stop the bleeding now. I had the most faith I've ever had that he would. I did. I felt genuinely full of faith that that bleeding would stop and she'd be okay. But at one o'clock, I felt this sense, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And interestingly, just a few weeks later, I went back to the hospital to sit down with Gemma's consultant because the, the speed of events of that week and in particular that day was so confusing and bewildering that you really didn't appreciate why what was happening was happening. So I went back just to find out, well, what, what did happen? Why did this complication occur? Uh, and we talked to him, and I, said, I just said to him, can I just ask you something, Andy? If, if Gemma had recovered 
if, say, at one o'clock my prayers had been answered. What was the outlook for her? And he said, I'm very sad to say, but by that point, she'd have been so brain damaged by what was happening in her brain that she'd have been unrecognisable from the Gemma you knew. And I thought, isn't that interesting that I had that sense at one o'clock, that it was time now to say goodbye and use those last four hours as it was to say goodbye and speak of stories of when we met and loads of stories about her and Ethan and everything. It's that I knew at that point. And, and that's where looking back on it, you go, I don't understand God why you let this happen. I know you didn't cause it to happen, but I don't understand why you didn't answer those prayers. But I know that even in the midst of those questions I had and that anger towards God, that somehow at one o'clock through some way, he, he kind of gently nudged me and said, now it's time for the goodbye. Um, because we wouldn't have got the Gemma back we knew if, she'd, if she had recovered at that point. Uh, and he was, he was in the room that day. And I, I, I did find it hard in the, the days and weeks afterwards when, you know, bless them, it's not just Christians, but lots of people say they're trying, they're trying their very best to say the right thing, but they end up saying something a little bit trite and platitudish. Maybe that's a word. Um, but things like, you know, you, well, you'll never, we'll never find out this side yeah. of heaven, why, yeah. what happened did happen. And I actually say to them, you know, I'm not even sure in heaven I'll find out then mm. because I, I think, I think based on what I read about heaven in the Bible, that it's going to be so beyond our wildest dreams and imagination. It's going to be so far better than we can ever imagine. The kind of when you get there, none of that will matter. Mm. It won't matter anymore. Yeah. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll never find out. And I had to let go of that. The, the search for the why I'll, I will never know the answer to. So instead of getting caught up with that, find a, find a reason to live again. Yeah, I, look, I've, I've shared a little bit of my story with you, but the, I, I, I've come a little bit, um, I feel at ease with it, the question of why, but the, the question that I still don't feel I've heard a, a good enough answer mm. to is the why that person and why not that person. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember at, at the time that my mum died, the whole church was praying. Yeah, our friends were praying. Yeah, um, you know we were praying with her in the room, but all all across our, our small town that we um, we lived in, people were praying, mm. and and nothing happened. And then yeah. when I was a teenager, um, we were living in Coventry, and um, a young lady in the church um, uh, fell ill with leukemia, and the whole church prayed. Yeah, and her prayers were answered. Yeah, and the church rightly celebrated yeah. that God had intervened. Yeah. But nobody has given me a good enough answer to this day, and, and I still ask the question some 25 years on, why did he not save my mum, but he saved that other lady? And I don't think you'll ever get an answer to that question. I remember when I was younger reading a book called Fear No Evil by David Watson, who was a very prominent Christian figure in the 80s. I think he was at St. Michael of Belfry in York. Amazing ministry he had there. You know, he was a big favourite of my dad and lots of people at our church at the time, and he got bowel cancer and died from it and I've read I remember reading his book many many years ago I might actually read it again because I found it I found it fascinating that very question you know here's an amazing Christian leader who's humble who's wise who's doing some incredible things has got this wonderful ministry that's blessing so many people he's got armies of Christians praying for him he's got people like Louis Palau the great Christian leader coming to his bedside to pray for him you know if ever you were putting all the things in line to get healing, they were all there for David Watson, but he died. He died and his ministry ended. I mean, the, you know, the, the after effects of what he did carried on, of course they did, but in terms of his physical ministry, in terms of David Watson being here, ended. And he sort of put the book down and go, I don't get it, God. I don't get why you've not intervened here and yet you have in other people. And, you know, some friends of ours have just come through a really scary few months and one of my closest friend's husband's just, just come through lung cancer and he was able to ring that bell on the ward that, that signals he's through, he's through, he's come through the other side and lots of people were praying for them. And I'll be honest enough to admit, of course, ultimately, I wanted him to get better. Of course I do. I want it more than anything. You know, to see, you know, I don't want to see my friend, you know, made a widow uh, in her early 40s. But also it was hard because, of course, when it was announced that he'd come through it, you look at the Facebook posts and all the comments, you know, God is good, you know, wow, what an amazing God we have. And you do look at it and go, he wasn't so amazing for us. He really wasn't. Mm. He didn't answer, he's answered your prayers, but he did not answer mine. And I think if you get too caught up in that and the anger and the bitterness and the questions will flow that I think eventually it would lead me to a place where I'd go, actually, I'm done mm. with this faith lark because... It's, it's just not fair. Uh, I think I just have to accept that even with 
faith, life can still be very unfair. And there are going to be questions that we will probably never find out the answer to. Um, and you just, I've just found I, I just have to let go of it. It's not easy though, is it? No, no, it's not. It's not. When, yeah, you're right. When you hear other stories of where God has intervened and done these amazing things, yeah, of course you're left going, right, okay, well, where was he on that day? In the hospital, um, you've got all this uh, awful stuff going on around you. Mm. In the book, you talk about having this peace that passes all understanding. Mm. There'll be people listening and say, please tell me what that peace <laughs> feels like. Well, it, it, it is a peace that passes all understanding because it comes into the... I never understood really what that verse meant. But years is it's a really nice, nice phrase, nice verse. I don't really get what it means. Is it just like just being in a happy place in life or, your, I don't know, your favourite beach or your favourite walk or whatever it might be? And I, just, I just feel peace, that peace that passes all understanding. I, I understood for the first time what actually that means. And it's finding God's peace in the most chaotic and scary of places. Uh, and I think if I'm being honest, there was an element of shock on that Friday. There definitely was. You're not kind of computing. I think your brain is protecting you from the, the sheer horror of what's unfolding. But I still had peace. I remember going to, you know, get Gemma's death certificate on the Tuesday. So it's only, what, four days, three days after she's gone. And dreading it, but walking into the St. John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford to get the certificates and sitting in the death registry office and you're watching a... You know, the last time I'd seen this happen was when I'm watching the woman in Wandsworth signing Ethan's birth certificate. And now you're watching a woman signing 10 copies of your wife's death certificate. And yet I felt this incredible peace. I felt it again on the Wednesday when we went to the funeral directors to put the funeral together. And our vicar David came with me. and He was just amazing. And again, I, I'm looking at a brochure. There's, a, there's, no, there's, there's no easy way to say this. I'm looking at a coffin brochure for my wife. And yet I felt this incredible peace, this, this sense of calm that really in that place doing that I should never, ever have had. And that's what I understood it to be. And I remember vividly probably the most powerful thing that happened came on the day of her funeral. And we, I, I don't have a lot of memories of that day. It was very, very hazy. Um, but I remember going to the crematorium later. So we had the, the celebrations, I called it, in, in the morning at Reading at our church, Greyfriars. Uh, and then we had a I hate the word wake, but the thing afterwards, <laughs> one of Gemma's favourite places in Sonning. Wake is just a rubbish okay. word. Um, and then we were the last slot back at Reading Crematorium in the afternoon. And so back we went with just a small group of family and friends. And I remember just the emotion of the day just hit me. And I remember collapsing to the gravel and just screaming. And when Gemma's hearse arrived, just shouting this kind of blood curdling no that sort of echoed through the, the gloom that was descending because it was early December. And I remember just a group of friends just gathering around me and kind of pulling me back to my feet. And I remember, I think it was Carl Beach actually was praying from the back in his gruff voice, just that, that God, that you'd hold this man right now, you'd hold their family as we go through the next few minutes and that your peace would descend on this place. We go into the room at the crematorium. It is everything you thought it would be, deeply depressing, gloomy, cold, horrible, just a horrible place. And as they bring Gemma's coffin in, it's feeling even more horrible. And, and then we play this song, it's a worship song, and it talks about you bring light in the darkness, you bring hope, you bring joy. And as this guy called Chris Saburn, who I know from New Wine, who leads the worship at New Wine Sings, he's obviously not there, but the, the New Wine version plays out of the OK speakers. <laughs> this incredible, tangible peace descended on that room. So much so that a, a friend of mine, um, his wife Nicola doesn't really have much of a faith. She lost her brother to suicide two years ago. She has stood next to a guy who used to be our curate in Reading, now runs a church in Oxford called Dan. I know Dan doesn't have a particularly good singing voice, but as people began to sing along, she says, I'm listening to this guy singing and he sounds angelic and yet I know he can't sing. And she said, I felt a peace I've never ever felt before. And I felt it as well, so much so that as I left that room, because people were kind of going up to the coffin and touching it and stuff, I just said, look, guys, sorry to break crematorium decorum, but she's not here. She's in heaven. I'm off. And I just went by dial and left with a smile on my face. Now, I'm not going to say everything after that was easy. It was deeply, deeply difficult. But in that moment, in that moment, in that most hopeless of places, this incredible peace descended that is even, even having an impact on people who wouldn't even say they've got a faith. That's the peace that passes all understanding. Yeah. That is not a room where peace should have dwelt. Amazing. You talk about a moment 
um, in the book where it seems to be you're at your lowest, mm. whether it be a few weeks or a few months on, and you talk about vividly feeling the presence of Jesus weeping yeah. beside you. Yeah. This really kind of struck me. <laughs> talk me through that and why that was such a, a comfort to you. It's been interesting in, in those first few months, really gaining an understanding of the Trinity and how it works in a way I'd never really had before. So I came to realize that God the Father was the one that I could take all my anger to and I could shout blue murder out from the end of our garden as I did for quite a few weeks in those early days because our garden in Reading sits just close to the River Thames so I'd quite regularly be spotted by joggers thankfully over the other side of the Thames on the towpath seeing this lunatic in a dressing gown and Wellington boots screaming blue murder at God but that's because the God I follow I know is big enough he's big enough to take me ranting at him and so I could throw all my anger all my questions all my angst onto him because I know that God is beyond big enough to take it God the Holy Spirit is the one that came alongside us in the crematorium that day and brought that peace that passes all understanding, that peace in the most chaotic of places. That's where the spirit works. And I was like, the crikey, I'm beginning to understand this in a tangible way for the first time. I kind of known it, but now I'm feeling it. And in terms of God the Son, and that story you, you referred to came, I think, on the second Saturday. And you know, as anybody listening or watching who's gone through grief, probably most people will know that sleep becomes your enemy for a while, and it really does. It just shakes your world up. And I can never stay asleep, so I was always awake from sort of half two. That was bad. Half three was all right. Half four, I considered in the early weeks to be a lay in. It was that bad. And I just, one Saturday morning, been up since about half two. And I was just sitting in our lounge, just sort of crying. And just I just felt broken, absolutely broken. And I thought, I'm just going to take myself off for a walk. My sister Becky was staying, had come down. I thought, I don't want to talk to anyone right now. And I just sort of walked down the garden, went through the gate at the bottom of the garden, and went to sit by the Thames I just sat next to a tree uh, you know and for a time when anybody goes through loss there is a period you go through where it does feel like all the colour has been drawn out of life that everything's become black and white and hopeless and joyless you can't ever begin to imagine a day where you'd ever feel joy again and you you don't want to because you feel well if I if I feel joy again then I've forgotten the woman I love but I remember sitting by that tree and just thinking, there is no joy left. This, this, this landscape, I, this land I now inhabit feels totally devoid of any hope. And I just wanted to roll in. I wanted, at that point, I wanted to end it. Um, and as that thought came into my head, two things happened. One was just the vivid, vivid face of Ethan looking at me and with the same eyes that he looked at me the night I told him my mum had gone. But I actually felt, I could just sense this, this presence alongside me and it felt like I could almost see Jesus just sitting next to me and he's not saying anything but he's weeping tears with me and that's God the Son God the Father is one I can shout blue murder at God the Son is the one as he did in the Bible is the one who gets alongside the brokenhearted he gets alongside the people who are difficult for others to get alongside and just knowing that he understood he understands he 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 endured what it's like to experience true darkness where there is no light in order that we never have to quite experience that and to know that he understands that and he f I just felt him that morning alongside me and it gave me the strength to get back on my feet and walk back into the house and go somehow somehow I'm going to find a way through this I don't think I've heard a better explanation of the trinity <laughs> oh, in, in all my times it's um yeah it's really powerful mm. Another example of you feeling God's presence in the book is you, you talk about feeling God through your friends and through the way that they mm. um, responded. Yeah. Um, how difficult would it have been without them there with you? I, I think it would have been impossible. Yeah, I, you, you are dealing with a huge, huge amount of stuff when something like this happens, and particularly when there hasn't been any time to prepare. You know, there was no, there was no sort of long illness where you get to sit down I, I know from having met people who've gone through this it's impossibly hard but no time to talk about the future no time to talk about bringing Ethan up and and how Gemma would want that and so everything comes at you you've had no time to prepare and you're you're hit by a myriad of fears about the future worries about what it's going to look like and you can't even begin to think about turning a kettle on you, you just literally in the early days I was trying to get through each hour 
And without that amazing army of people around us, I don't know how to got through each hour. And yeah, a mate of mine called Dave, who lives on the same estate of us, I've known Dave for 25 years. He, I describe him in the book as like this military commander, just organizing visits, organizing meals, making sure that all the practical things that you can't even begin to think about but still need to happen, you still need to eat. He was looking after everything. Uh, and this group of people, a friend of mine called Lucy, who'd lost her mum actually only a few months before, you know, she came and just sat at the kitchen table for two days and all the admin you have to sort out when someone goes, the closing down of accounts, of phone contracts, of sorting out her pension, just so many things that I could not have even begun to think about for weeks. It's all been done by this amazing team of people around us. And uh, I would not have got through those first weeks. You know, we didn't sleep, but my biggest fear when this happened is going it alone. That first day when it was just going to be myself and Ethan in the house, because we got, you know, we're very blessed, we've got a big house. We always dreamt of it being a house that would have two or three kids in it. It's a big family house. And so when a third of the people who inhabit that house have gone, it feels really desperately empty. And I feared, and Ethan feared, that first day we'd go alone. We didn't sleep alone in the house for the first 16 weeks. It was made sure that there was always someone staying the night. And yeah, I, I would not have, got, not have got near getting through those first few weeks. I'd have had to find a way. I, I genuinely don't know how I'd have found a way if we hadn't had that group of people around us. You had quite a few people on Twitter when you began to tell your mm. story of grief, saying, why is it, why is it being so open? <laughs> and uh, da Dan Walker touches upon this uh, in his introduction. But I think for me, one of the, uh, I hesitant to use the word encouraging things about this story, but is that you've given people a, an example of, uh, of how to respond in a situation like this. Because often yeah. when people come to grief, they, they don't know how to respond. They don't know what to, to do. And um, again, you hinted earlier on in, the, um, in our conversation that when people, they don't know what to say and, and, mm. and they kind of stumble, stumble through it. Um, I want to kind of take the next few minutes to kind of, you know, some learning messages to, yeah. to those who are listening, yeah. um, both those who are ex experiencing grief and those supporting people mm. through grief. Um, <laughs> I'll start with the one that I found most fun was you talked about Christian Deliveroo. <laughs> and this idea of people bringing bringing you dinners, yeah. Um, those little acts, how much of an influence did, did they have, and, and and what can we learn from that in terms of just just loving people through their grief? Yeah, I, I think I think the thing we struggle with when we're trying to support people go through grief is we're, we're trying to search for answers, we're trying to search for reasons, we're trying to search for the right words, and sometimes it's as simple as just being practical which so many of my friends were. So, you know, a group of people at the church are providing meals for the first few weeks. So never had to worry about cooking, never had to worry where the next meal was coming from. We'll just open the freezer. Oh, look, there's a, there's a bolognese, there's a chili. Or, you know, away we go. And that lasted for weeks. Practical help is so important because, you know, if, if you are finding it difficult to know how to get alongside someone who's just lost, you don't feel equipped in terms of, you know, emotional maturity or, or being able to express yourself, well, express it in other ways and being practical you know just saying is there anything i can do for you today is really important what i would say to people and i had a few of these messages and i know that other people have gone through it is that really what you need to be saying to people when you offer help is not say to them let me know if you need anything it's actually is there anything i can do when you say let me know if i need anything you are basically putting the onus on the person who's going through it to reach out to you and invariably I know from my experience I didn't it wasn't a pride thing I'd forget that they'd said it or I just hadn't got the emotional energy to reach out and say today I need this but when people say you know what can I do they're inviting a response and so invariably we'll respond well, you know today I just I just need Ethan picking up I, I, I'm in a bad place I'm struggling today so it's it's those practical things can be so so important in, in lessening what is already a huge load on that person you know, just the pain of losing someone, the massive questions you have about the future, particularly when there's children involved. You know, if you can take away some of the stuff that they don't need to worry about, then it allows them the time to focus on the things that they simply cannot escape worrying about. Let's talk about words, language, <laughs> uh, because... Emojis. Yeah, <laughs> you talk about your infuriation with the... Uh, the, the line uh, there is no words yeah um, because like you say in the book there are there are <laughs> clearly um, yeah. words uh, to say um 
we walk into church on Sunday, there's somebody there who's who's lost. Mm. Um, and then the other example that uh, made me laugh was the when you saw somebody in the shop and the head went down and they just didn't want to make eye contact. And, and no, and someone I knew could reasonably well yeah. would always say hello to her if yeah. I ever saw her. And, and I think that, that's a temptation. Even, you know, if we're in church on Sunday and mm. there's somebody there, I, think, I just don't want to have that conversation yeah. or, or <laughs> dare I say, I don't know what to say. Mm. How, how do we approach that conversation with a person? I think you have to recognize that however difficult it is, when you say something like there are no words or you say nothing, you're essentially not acknowledging what's happened. And that for someone who's going through loss is really hard, particularly if it's people they know. And I found that phrase, there are no words, really difficult to deal with because I felt it was not acknowledging what had happened. You know, I haven't lost my dog here. I've lost my wife. And more importantly, I've lost the mother to my son. There are no words that that's that's not really acknowledging what's happened. And if you can't find the words, I think sometimes we want to be a bit clever. We want to find something really deep and meaningful to say. You just have to understand at that point, there's probably nothing meaningful you can say that's going to help. It's just about knowing that you're not alone. So just saying, and I understand for people listening to this right now, they go, that sounds so kind of inadequate but just saying, I'm so sorry for what's happened, for your loss, to hear about Gemma, is everything. You know, it's, it's, it's a simple act of reaching out and you are acknowledging what's happened. And that is really, really important. You know, I, I've, I found one woman in particular, I tell in the book, I won't use the language here, not just because it's Premier Radio, but anywhere in broadcasting, <laughs> but yeah, I, bump, I tell the story in the book, the kind of woman who nailed it was, was stood in a, in a coffee shop in Caversham where we live and i realized as i stood there in the queue i think i kind of recognize i couldn't place her in, in the end she turned around and said hi you might not know me but i was one of the mums at ethan's nursery i knew Gemma. I was like, oh that's where i know you from and she just said i am so so sorry for what's happened it's just swear word another swear word and in that moment she absolutely nailed it because what had happened to Gemma was all those words and i'm not advocating that in terms of you know reaching out to the bereaved that you turn the air blue but she she nailed the pain of what that felt like uh, but when other people just say oh you know, there are no words well no she found them it may not be the words you choose but she found them and it, it's it's so important to just to know that you're not on your own that what has happened is being acknowledged you know, i found it really difficult at new wine last year you know we we went back and it was really hard because it's one of those moments in the year you know have those regular things you do every year and when you when they come out or along again, you, you drive back into New Wine or Glastonbury that's happening, you know, as we speak at the moment, you have that kind of, how's that a year, you know? And we were back there, how's that a year? And yet everything has changed in the last year. And yet I'd be bumping into some old friends who I don't see apart from at New Wine every year, just the usual yearly catch up. How's your year been? Blah, blah. And nine out of 10 of those conversations, I did count. Uh, nine out of ten of those conversations, the people I spoke to never acknowledged what had happened. Now, I get that seven or eight months on from losing Gemma, probably they were a bit like, what on earth do you say seven or eight months? It sounds a bit silly now to say I'm so sorry. But actually, even all those months on, if you've not seen them, that's absolutely fine. And that's enough because you're just acknowledging that life has changed. And yet they were talking to me like literally nothing had happened like it always been just me and ethan turning up at new wine and like why where you know what groups are you in this year and where, whereabouts are you camping or oh, orange Fire? oh we're in orange fire we'll come and say hello and you sort of walked away going my world's just totally changed the world as it was 12 months ago as a new wine is now vastly vastly different and you just talked to me like nothing ever happened and that's hard for brief people when it's not it's acknowledging it that's the most important thing. And I do make the point about emojis at the back because I'm just going to say this. Uh, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm really sorry to break it to you folks, but if you are trying to get alongside someone who has lost a loved one, uh, a praying hands emoji or a tear face emoji does not cut the mustard. And I'm quite, I just, it, just do, it doesn't, it doesn't. I get why it happens. We live in emoji culture now, but mm. it's, it's hopelessly inadequate. Mm. I'm really sorry to say. So to the person who's going through grief then, um, yeah. I guess there's a, a kind of a theme throughout the book where, where's this uh, searching for light in the darkness. Yes. Um, it sounds simple, but when you're in the darkness, yeah. finding that light can be really difficult. So, really hard. Yeah. What, what's your advice to someone <laughs> searching for that light? Well, interesting. I, I Quite a random thing happened last night in that I, I got put in touch by 
um, a, a guy I'd met at a book signing event last night we had in our hometown. He's called Brian McDermott. He used to be the Reading manager. And we had a little chat afterwards. And he happens to know Russell Brand. It's all quite random, this. And Russell Brand is currently in L.A., and he said, I want to connect you two because Russell Brand's been very open and honest about his battles with addiction and mental health problems and all that. So last night, suddenly I'm texting Russell Brand and he says, mate, it was so nice to hear from you and chat to you, but I feel bad for asking you this, but I've got a friend who's literally just lost his wife two days ago. He's got two kids and he's suicidal. Would you talk to him? And I said, of course I will. So late last night, I'm on the, guy, on the phone to a guy in LA I've never heard of who's just lost his wife. And he's on the verge of giving up. And I kept saying to him, mate, however dark it feels right now, however utterly hopeless it is right now, there is a way through. You won't see it now, but there is. You've just got to hang on, even if it's by one single fingernail. Hang on, because those girls, your two daughters, are going to need you more than ever. They don't need to become an orphan. And it's about just driving with every ounce of strength you've got through those low times, those dark times, those hopeless times. And learning to understand, you know, I, I remember people saying to me who knew what they were talking about in the early days, you know, it will one day get easier. When you're in the midst of it, that is an affront. I talk about in the book, it feels like an affront. How dare you suggest this is going to get easier? But of course, they're right. It does. And I describe it as, as time goes on. I just try and encourage people going through this. There's just hang on in there with whatever you've got strength wise left. Hang on. And if it's just by one finger, hang on with that one finger but just get through the first hour, it's the early stages, then get through the morning, then get through the afternoon, then just concentrate, can I get myself through today? And then you'll, before you know it, suddenly you're getting through the week and then you're somehow getting through the month and bit by bit, the sun begins to break through again and it begins to shine in patches, but then it goes gloomy again and another wave comes and hits you from behind. But as time goes on, it elongates. And I, I think the biggest kind of moment of realization about what life is going to look like going forward particularly for Ethan came on the night that I talk about in the book where he was given this amazing opportunity to be England mascot for the night now the FA the football world was so so kind to us and generous and the FA asked Ethan to be mascot for the home friendly against Italy last March and as he walks out I, I was very lucky I was able to stand right by the tunnel and watch him coming out first with the England captain for the night Eric Dyer and just seeing his, his look of wonder on his face as he looks up at this immense crowd and all the cheers. And I just shouted, Ethan, as he went past. Huge smile on his face. And watching him stood there aghast in the middle as the anthems played out and looking around, I could not in that moment have felt any more fatherly pride and love than I did. I just, this is what an amazing moment. But of course, also a painful moment because his mum's not there to see it. And I could imagine Gemma looking on with probably a tear running down her face. And Ethan says to me in the car on the way home, Daddy, I had such an amazing night tonight. Such an amazing, I'm so sad that mummy's not here to see it. And you'll know something of this, having lost your mum when you're the same age as Ethan, is that you get to a stage in life where you have to accept, hard though it is, is that life can still be enjoyed again. You can still laugh again and you will laugh again. And life is still there to be savoured, to be enjoyed, to be loved, to be cherished. But you have to accept, particularly for Ethan, particularly for him, is that when those moments, those life milestones come, like maybe it's the day he leaves school, the day he passes, hopefully, his exams, the day he maybe graduates or gets married, whatever they might be, those big milestones that we look ahead to in life when we're young, he's going to have to learn, and he already is learning this already, and it's painful at first, is that alongside joy in his life is always going to sit that pain that mum's not here. And I just say to him, and I say to others going through this, don't let the pain rob you of the joy mm. just learn difficult though it is to accept that the two can coexist and i'm just trying to help my boy just to understand that a bit more that we can still have and we have had some amazing times and he's done some utterly incredible things i sometimes think if Gemma came back now just sitting down and telling her what had happened in the last 19 months would take forever in particularly what he's done but it's it's knowing that 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 is going to be life going forward but life i firmly believe can still be amazing it's of course going to be different and for him in particular it's always going to be that that pain alongside him that his mum's not around yeah. to see it uh, yeah. that's bang on I, I remember my wedding day you know yeah. best best day of my life i remember crying like a baby in my wedding speech yeah. because i wanted to i can see your mum looking on yeah 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 and um that doesn't leave you but you know no. what is what are we 25 years on yeah when my baby was born you know, wanted to her to see her. You're gonna be handing the baby to the mum. Yeah, first grandma yeah, yeah, cuddle, yeah, don't you? That. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> back onto you. Um, <laughs> what would the 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 grief process have looked like had you not had faith? It's an interesting question. I've been, I've been asked that once or twice, and I, and I look at it in one way and say that in some ways it would have been less complicated because if I take faith out of the equation, if I take a belief in God out of the equation, then those questions about where were you God on that Friday, they don't exist because if I don't believe in a God, there's no questions to ask. So in some ways, having a faith adds another layer to what already is really, really difficult in that on top of everything you're feeling, I've now got these questions about, well, who on earth is this God I follow? What is his character? Why does he allow these kind of things to happen? Why, if I pray, please don't let Ethan grow up without a mum, does he allow that to happen? No, because God could have chosen to intervene, like we've been talking about, as he does with other people, for whatever reason, didn't in that. I wouldn't be dealing with those questions. I'd just be getting on with life and dealing with grief and all the pain that would still be there, regardless of whether I have a faith or not. But I can't imagine going through this without hope. I can't. I cannot imagine what it must be like to lose your loved one and to see your boy lose his mum and to know there is no hope of him ever seeing mum again. There is no hope of life after all this. I could not, I don't know how I'd have navigated it because yeah, there were times when I felt, I don't know where God is. He feels like he's, he's silent at the moment. But as time goes on, you see it through some of the stories I tell in the books about those random acts of kindness, the way God just reminded us at different points that no, I'm still here and I'm doing what I always do. I'm working through people and through random people, people I'd never heard of before. He never left my side for one moment. Uh, and so it has been a huge factor in that hope drives you on. Hope drives you on, the hope that life can be good again, the hope that Ethan is gonna grow up to be a fine young man like his mum would have hoped, and of course I hope. But if I take God out of the equation, a lot of that hope dies. And I quite simply don't know how people deal with death and with grief when essentially they don't have any hope of this being anymore. And there's was one line I wrote in the book, you know, the hymn, you know, thine be the glory, where it says death has lost its sting. And I remember seeing that line and thinking about it when I was writing and I thought, you know what, death hasn't lost its sting. Because actually in some ways you've seen that line, we know what ultimately it's talking about, but death is still incredibly painful and it still stings like hell. The great thing is when you have faith in God is that it's not a fatal sting anymore. And that's the big difference. You seem to have a love-hate relationship with church. <laughs> <laughs> Call me out. <laughs> the book talks about um, a, a number of instances where you, um, you you feel the need you just can't sit in church um, mm. a, anymore. And, and that's um, before the grieving process, when, when you're mm. um, going through the um, depression time as well. What can the, the church learn from... <sighs> from your story in regards to how they can better serve people who are going through tough times? You know, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, any given church, and in particular church services, can't be all things to all people. There will be people sat there for whom this particular service just doesn't connect with them. You can't cover all the bases. You know, if you're, you're doing a sermon on, I don't know, marriage or whatever it is, there's going to be people there who will find that very difficult to hear. They might choose not to come on that particular Sunday. You can't tailor everything to suit where everybody's at because then you'd end up saying nothing because it's, that's in, absolutely impossible. I think, I think what I've struggled with, and I think Christians struggle with a little bit when it comes to bereavement, when particularly it comes to death at the wrong time in life, where it's not happened as a result of the expected order of events that life brings us, that we've reached a ripe old age, we've ticked all the boxes and we go. We have a reference point for that. We don't, as Christians, have a reference point for it when stories like this happen and happens to countless other people when they are having their lives stolen from them like your mum had her life stolen by cancer. It affects so many people. We know that and it affects Christians as well. And it really, I think, it shakes people's faith as well as yours and it interrupts cosy Christianity. It's a stark reminder that we are not protected from any of this stuff. And I, I think sometimes Christians shy away from talking about it and talking about it with you because it's challenging their faith, but it's also holding a mirror up to them that says, this could have been you or this could be you. And I think for all of us, we want to kind of distance ourselves a little bit from 
some of the harsher realities of life. And, and I, I feel sometimes with Christians, they don't really want to engage with some of the more difficult things because that doesn't kind of fit their faith narrative that people do depressed or Christians could get suicidal or Christians suffer a tragedy or a loss of someone at a really young age. Um, I think we've got to get better at that. We've got to get better at being able to talk to each other. You know, I'd set up a men's group called the Bacon Boys, just trying to get men together before all this happened to be able to be more kind of open and honest and accountable with each other. That takes time, but we've got to get better, particularly guys in the church, at talking about our fears, talking about the things we struggle with. I'm not advocating that all the time we just go on about how difficult life is, but it's giving people the opportunity when life is tough. Church should be the place where they can say, I am finding life tough right now. But too often it's the place where they feel they can't say that because they're breaking through and interrupting cozy church. Uh, Please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying every church is like this because they're not, and my church has been amazing. But I think Christians, probably more than anyone, struggle with knowing how to get alongside the bereaved because, like I was saying, having a faith adds that layer of complexity to it because it's, of course, going to make them ask questions of God and why he allows these kind of things to happen. And sometimes, like with non-Christians as well, when we deal with something difficult, it's easy to put your fingers in your ears and hum loudly and pretend it hasn't happened. Final question, what's next? This wasn't, I guess, <laughs> the the path you expected life to, to bring you. You've, uh, in a situation where you've given up part of your, your work. Mm. Um, yeah, what does the future hold? Well, I, I describe it, it's, it's, it's a new chapter. It's a new chapter and chapter one ended in a way that none of us wanted and none of us expected. But that chapter has closed. And I know that Gemma, if she was here right now, would say, Simon, you've got to, you've got to move on with life. You've got to be there for Ethan. You've got to carry on savoring life and enjoying it because I want that for my boy. I don't want you to be stuck in what happened 19 months ago. You've got to move forward. You know, you never get over the loss of someone. There's no way round grief. There's no way over it, but there is a, a narrow way through it, which, you know, Dan Walker talks about in the forward. And for me now, I, I do look, forward with with optimism and actually bizarre though this may sound to some people i i feel excited because it's it's not the future that any of us would have chosen but we've been given we've been given this new chapter and it's now the only question is what are you going to do what kind of story are you going to write i have to write for my boy a great story if i can you know i've seen this boy grow up to be the man that we both wanted him to be for him to go on and do amazing things in whatever shape or form that takes uh, and I, I just see life now as this incredible gift in a way I never saw it before. And, you know, I make a point in the bit at the end, the 12 things I've learned in the 12 months about grief. I said, you know, getting older is a blessing and not a curse. I think all too often in our society, we get obsessed, particularly when we get to the middle age period in life, about age. You know, how old are you next? Well, I'm going to be 47. Cool, 47, oh, three more years, you're 50. My mates still say that, even though I turn around and say, do you know what? I don't care. I do not care if I'm 50 in three years' time. Yeah, I wish I was younger and had more years ahead. But you know what? I've had six more years, seven more years than Gemma did. I've got to enjoy 19 more months watching my boy grow up than she ever had. And so I should count myself as incredibly blessed that however hard life is, I've got an amazing opportunity to bring that boy up and to be the responsible one who has now been given all the responsibility to see him grow into a fine man. And life is there to be cherished. We only get one shot of this life on earth. I don't want to go to heaven anytime soon. I'm not in a rush to get there. I want to enjoy. I want to save a life. And I believe that we'll look back in years to come and however painful that period was and however painful at times Ethan's life has been, we'll look back and go, you know what? We made something really good out of something really hard. It's been said that Christians should preach with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Well, I'd like to suggest adding one more publication to your reading list, Premier Christianity Magazine. I'm Sam Hales, editor of the magazine. We exist to help you be informed, inspired and equipped to be a light in today's culture, wherever you are. You'll find fresh theological perspectives on the big issues, Christ-centred analysis of popular culture and loads of faith-filled interviews with high-profile leaders, politicians, writers, musicians, comedians, sports stars, theologians, activists and many more. We have a 50-year track record of holding fast to the core truths of the Christian faith while also encouraging a vibrant conversation around the big issues affecting both the church and culture today. So if you're a Christian who wants to build your faith and put Jesus front and centre in your everyday life, then why not pick up a free sample copy of the magazine today? 
just visit premierchristianity.com.